The paradox of education is just this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. That quote is from James Baldwin. That quote is from his 1963 talk to teachers. And the reason why I bring that up is, how conscious are you, how conscious are we, how conscious should we be when it comes to this conversation around artificial intelligence? So I'm going to lay out a thinking prompt for you all around what we need to think about with this. My big thing around the current narratives of AI, whether it be access, whether it be inclusion, whether it be efficiency, and I'll even say cheating and plagiarism, all of it distills down to one core a component that I bring up, and that is power dynamics. What do, how do power dynamics play a significant role in our disposition towards and our consciousness of AI? And so I'm gonna share with you all a couple of things. So number one, a lot of people are like, oh, it's new, it's new. First of all, it's everywhere and it's been around since the mid 50s. It's also in all of our devices, uh, many other places too, and it's actually even in places that we don't even realize. And so it's not this whole new technology that we've never been exposed to, it's been around. So I wanna share with you all, to get an idea of the consciousness of where people are on this, a few of the headlines over the last six months. So first, researchers warn of danger, call for pause in bringing AI to schools. Next one, artificial intelligence education, teachers' opinions on AI in a classroom. Next one, could AI save education? Where does AI belong in education? Teachers and administrators have strong opinions. We know this. Navigating the artificial intelligence revolution in schools. What educators think about using AI in schools? The unintended consequences of artificial intelligence education. Without an AI strategy, the Department of Education risks delaying opportunity to close learning gaps. And then the last one. Now AI can write students' essays for them. Will everyone become a cheat? All of those headlines point back to what I just shared at the beginning. They all directly connect to a, a disposition around power dynamics. Who's controlling the narrative and what are they doing with the access? Why is access not guaranteed for some, but it is for others? This big whole idea around AI is touches on the following. Can it revolutionize learning? My whole pitch around power dynamics is it will not revolutionize learning until we address the equity concerns. You cannot have a conversation about achievement until it starts with access. And the whole idea about, around this whole revolution, it will not occur if that access is not ubiquitous. And so I wanna share with you all a few uh, things to think about around the promises of AI and the perils of AI in that context of power dynamic. So the first one is the following. Yes, AI can personalize learning. We know this especially, again, given the access. What else can it do? It can support the synthesis of data and help us support making decisions that are based on data. I don't have time to go into it, but I would say it also depends on what data we're using, what data is being aggregated, and who's analyzing that data. But to continue on, it also can look at, we can also look at it and use it ways for increased accessibility and increased inclusivity. Those are all the things that this promise is. But again, I go back to what I shared at the beginning. How does all that play a role in power dynamics? Who's making the decisions? Who's controlling the access? Now let's get into what are the things that we need to be concerned about? One of my favorite questions I ask around AI in the workshops I lead and conversations I have with many of my friends is, do we want some of the information? Or excuse me, do you want the best information or do you want all of the information? And we need to have the whole picture so that it supports a critical and analytical approach. Anyway, with the perils, there's one, digital divide. Yes, it is real. Yes, it still exists, even though we're post-COVID-ish, but there is a digital divide. Want to know? Here's one of my receipts. Take a look at all the school districts throughout the country and ask yourself, who has access to AI? Who doesn't? What kind of access do they have? And then we'll even get into where does broadband access exist and where does it not exist? Why can I go and look at a major urban center and identify the likelihood of broadband access based on zip code? Again, that's one of the perils. Some will have it, some won't. Also, that goes into the whole idea around unequal access to the tools and the infrastructure. As you have spent time at this conference and you're looking at all these different platforms and all these different tools, the whole idea, again, the peril. What happens when some have the access and what happens when some don't have the access? How do power dynamics play a role in that? Continuing on, the exacerbation of existing inequities. Yes, AI is designed to automate things. 
But automation and, syn uh, and, and efficiency are one, they're not synonymous, and two, automation can also occur in things that provide unintended consequences. Then the other big one that I'm a big advocate for us paying attention to is the algorithmic bias and discrimination. Why is it that, for example, I can go in an image generator and I can type in a prompt saying, one doctor and two nurses, and I know there's a high probability that that doctor will not look like me. And I know there's a high probability that those two nurses are going to be female. Why is it that when I do one of my favorite things with one of the large language models, uh, which I've shared, is I say, I want you to generate a, uh, a, a screenplay a one-scene screenplay of a conversation between a doctor and a nurse assessing a patient for cardiac arrest. Why do I know that it's gonna say have that doctor be identified as male despite me not having it in the prompt? Doctor's gonna be male, nurse is gonna be female. What other automated biases exist in these platforms that we need to be aware of, we need to be conscious of, and we need to be able to navigate around? Continuing on, the data itself. What data is being used? This is why I encourage educators. When you go around here, what data sets are you using? Where, how, what, what are your mechanisms for cleansing of that data? How are you accounting for a bias that's embedded in the algorithms? It's a true fact that it is in the algorithm. If it is designed by a human, then it is susceptible to that human's biases, no matter what. There can be safeguards in place, but the first step around this, again, power dynamics, the first step is to be able to identify and acknowledge that it exists in the first place. And here's where this all connects to a couple of other things. What is the impact of these systems on how we use them in school? I'm literally watching now where there are considerations around things like using AI to uh, set up student scheduling, okay? Again, efficiency, or excuse me, automation is not necessarily a good thing. But here's a catch with that, going back to those bi the biased data set. If a student looks like me, and historically, they have been told, which was me, by the way, you are not permitted to or taking advanced placement classes or high academic rigor classes are not for you. What is the danger that will occur when that becomes automated? And what happens when you hear the following? Because I've heard this. Well, I know that's not the result we want, but you know, it's in the tech and it's a techie thing. See that? That's what can happen. Why is it that I'm also starting to see instances where um, AI is being used to determine which students are likely to be identified as highly gifted, which students are likely to be identified as needing diverse learners resource and supports like special ed, which students are likely to be discipline problems, which students are, do we, how are we going to respond to those? These are some of the perils, and I'll continue on with this thing. Privacy concerns and data exploitation, favorite thing to talk about. What data is being used? What's training that data? All of us, when we use tech, we are providing information. That's why now I, I think it's called like the data economy. Your most valuable resource you have is you and your usage. That determines all these things. We need to ask the questions uh, like that. Continuing on, what data is being collected? Especially student data. Yes, there's FERPA and there's COPA, but, but like real talk, FERPA and COPA exist not to protect students. They exist to protect school districts from litigation. That's why they're there, okay? So the whole idea is to recognize what data is being used and how is it being used. And I will share with you all, one of my top three oxymorons is internet privacy, okay? So the whole idea is if you acknowledge and accept the fact that many of the things that we do are not necessarily going to be private, then now let's take ownership of how we use them and the questions that we ask around them. And I'll even continue on. What about the transparency and the ethical practices? You know, not to disparage any specific uh, uh, vendor that's in here, but I would even ask that. One of my favorite things that I bring up is around, uh, you know, the dynamic, again, power dynamic, the dynamic in a classroom of where a teacher suspects or accuses a student of cheating, excuse me, of, of, uh, of, of cheating and plagiarism. So let's start off with which students are more likely to be accused of that right from the beginning. Let's start there. Then let's get into the whole idea around ethical data practices. If you take my intellectual property and you put it into this checker, can you guarantee me that that checker is going to work? Did they tell you what the efficacy rate is? And then what's happening with my data? And my big thing when it comes to the transparency and ethical data practices, did you even ask me if I'm okay with you doing that? That's my favorite question to ask. 
if you are going to do that, then my whole thing is, then I want you to show me that paper that I signed acknowledging, knowledge and consent that that's what you're doing with my intellectual property. Again, power dynamics. And then continuing on is this whole idea around what are the things that can occur that actually dehumanize us as educators and the whole idea that what I always say is, and again, power dynamic, it takes education and turns it from a relational endeavor to a transactional endeavor. One, over-reliance on automation. Just because it can be automated doesn't necessarily mean it should. And I don't believe in automation of learning, and I certainly don't believe in the automation or the microwaving of relationships. It cannot replace that. It should not replace that. But the catch for us is, are we aware of how that works, and where can automation work for us, and where might it work against us? The other component to be aware of, of dehumanization, is the decline of the human connection and empathy. Every single time, and trust me, I'm a tech guy, I love it, but every single time I take something that I can do of a meaningful connection or relationship, and I offload that to the tech, I run the risk of doing this. What could go wrong there? And now imagine doing that, and then now it's not only automated, but I can't explain what's automated out of it. I just go based on what the end result is. And so this is the whole idea around, we have to really start to ask these questions, and that's why I keep going back to the central point of my time up here, is think about the power dynamics. If, as you all are, are, are sitting here, and even your, at your time at this conference, like one of my favorite questions, like, does your school or district even have an ethics policy? And if it does, did it include student voice in the construction of it? If it doesn't, and you know you need one, what might that look like, including the school community, the teachers, the students, the parents? Because if everyone's voice is included in that policy, you increase this and you decrease the likelihood of many of those other perils that I shared. And so what does it look like navigating a pathway forward? Well, number one, digital literacy is essential, essential. We have, to, we have to encourage ourselves and our learners to really look at the effective, responsible, and responsive use to technology. It can no longer be like it's been for a long time. Oh, you're comfortable with tech, just use the tech. It has to be, I need to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, how is it possible to, or what is possible to do things without the tech, and why we need to understand the things that are necessary to use tech. Continuing on, we need to demand transparency and accountability in AI development and deployment. I'm just telling you, I'm not gonna win any favors over here, I don't care, I'll get in good trouble. But there needs to be transparency and accountability. For example, I'll share with you all, one of my first things I do when I'm told, oh, there's a new platform. First thing I do, I don't go to the platform, I go to the, the, the decision-making and design team. I wanna see who's on that team. And sadly, 99% of the time, it is not somebody who looks like me or most of the students that I work with. So we need to demand that. There also needs to be this whole idea around are those teams inclusive? Are they considering your voices, my voices, our voices in the context of the development and the design of these platforms, how these platforms are implemented? And my whole thing is the following. What is the intended impact you expect to and want to have on education? It leads me kind of along the lines of these three ethical questions that I always pose. First of all, the first question, is it, a, is it against the law and does it violate explicit school or district policy? The second question to ask is, how would, I feel, what, 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 how would I feel if it were done to me? And then the third most important question I bring up is, am I sacrificing long-term benefits for short-term gains? All of those tie into the whole thing around what can we do uh, to demand more transparency and accountability. And then the last thing for me is all, the last couple of things is this whole thing around how might we use it to empower educators and students to shape the future of AI and education. I brought it up in a session and I'm gonna bring it up here with you all now. We do not have to accept what we are being told. We can dictate and take ownership of that conversation and say, these are the things that we need within education. Somebody's gonna build it, and of course, if somebody doesn't, then they will be lost, left out. And that's the whole idea around the, this component of empowerment. And then I would also say the following, we need to advocate for policies and regulations that prioritize eth equity and ethics. The ethics part is the access and the accessibility, and then of course the, uh, the, the equity is that it becomes ubiquitous. So what's next for all of us as I conclude? One is the critical role we all play together. All of us are here together. Just imagine 
if all of us were, ampl were able to amplify and raise our collective voices around many of the points that I shared. That connects to the whole idea around collective action and ac ac advocacy. And then my final thing to share with you all is to recognize within yourselves and we need to recognize within each other. Do we have the wisdom to ask the right questions and do we have the courage to support each other in demanding the answers? Thank you all very much.